Hi, everyone. I think we're going to begin, even if we have a few additional uh, people joining us over the next little while. Um, I'm Esther Shipman. I'm the Curator for Architecture and Design at Design at Riverside, just down the hall. And um, I'm very pleased this evening uh, to welcome Frederic Dubay, who is a, a principal, a partner at uh, La Pointe Man et Associé in Montreal. Um, we have um, mounted um, a very interesting exhibition uh, that is a 20 year retrospective uh, at Design at Riverside at, of the work, uh, the public projects, some key public projects by LMNA. Um, and uh, I think that uh, if we have some time this evening, um, we'll uh, see if we have an opportunity to go there with Frederic and uh, Mary Paul, Mary Paul MacDonald, who most of you I, I hope know uh, is an associate professor here and who is actually the curator of this uh, exhibition and um, key editor of the um, catalog that we have for the show. Um, this particular exhibit is interesting uh, for us at the gallery for a number of reasons, uh, primarily because um, there is uh, not as much communication between provinces, even Ontario and Quebec who are bordering each other, um, and there seems to be lots of visits back and forth, um, but not a lot, not many firms uh, for a variety of reasons, legislation being some, uh, and so on. Um, not a lot of design and building going on between the two. And as a result, uh, there is a certain kind of um, silo or uh, separation, not necessarily um, uh, actively or aggressively so, but that's the natural result of uh, some of these um, you know, borders, visual and physical. And um, I've wanted for a long time to showcase uh, work from a number of different disciplines uh, in Quebec, and we have had uh, individual firms in landscape architecture, in architecture, in product design, in graphic design. Uh, but this is the first time that we've had um, an entire exhibition dedicated to one firm from Quebec, and so we're able to see multiple projects, really get an insight into um, what's driving them both historically and um, uh, in the now. And so uh, for me, it's a, it's a very exciting experience. And we have a little committee where we uh, discuss future plans for exhibits. And uh, it was quite a coincidence where we discussed uh, what was going to be taking place in 2013 and that we had a gap at a certain time and so on. And um, I think it was John McMinn who mentioned that Marie Paul had um, been working on uh, an interesting exhibit. And the very next day, I received an email from uh, Maison uh, de l'Architecture de Québec, uh, which is the organization um, uh, behind uh, uh, sort of a movement to develop uh, these monographic shows uh, showcasing uh, individual firms in Quebec who've made a substantial um, contribution to um, the landscape uh, of architecture in Quebec and uh, very influential on subsequent generations of architects and um, uh, the public audience as well. So. Um, I'm very pleased to say, obviously, we were able to strike a deal that we uh, had so many uh, points of intersection here, this idea of showing Quebec, the idea that uh, Marie Paul uh, is based here and uh, it teaches at the school, and it's really very exciting. So I'm, I'm quite pleased to um, introduce uh, Frédéric Dubay, uh, one of four partners at uh, Le Pointe Man a associé, and uh, he will walk you through, I think, um, the specifics of a number of key projects and tell you, uh, you know, more uh, detail of 
um, their directions and, and their philosophies and, and so on. I think the program tonight is that Frederic will uh, be speaking and then Mary Paul will um, come up and join him uh, with a couple of uh, prearranged questions and then also invite questions uh, from the audience as well. So uh, I'd like to invite Frederic up here. Um, thank you so much for traveling a second time to Cambridge and for spending all day uh, today at the school since early in the morning um, uh, working with a, at least one and possibly two classes. So thank you very much, Frederic. Um, good evening. Um, thank you uh, for the introduction, Esther, and uh, extended thanks also for the school to the school for having me here tonight for this lecture. Um, it is always a bit uh, daunting to to come to a university and show your projects to future architects or to fellow teachers and also to hopefully a few curious citizens. Um, it might seem that websites of uh, architectural practices now do a good job at uh, sending into the internet world images of the projects. Yet I remain confident, however, that hearing what architects have to say about their work is a still useful endeavor. And it allows you and I to spend an hour together considering the project, and I'll try to keep my word as to keeping this under one an hour. Um, just a, a few words about where I come from. I've been um, teaching for more than 10 years at the University of Montréal and practicing for 25 years. And um, just I would not have imagined teaching when I was studying if it had not been for the director of the University of Montréal uh, 10 years ago, Georges Ademchik. So our office would probably never have dared imagine mounting an exhibition on its work had it not been for Sophie Gironé, which is the director of the Maison d'Architecture that Esther mentioned. And just a few words, therefore, on the exhibition per se, per se uh, to start with. Um, how it came about and what were the discussions we were having while mounting it. Once Marie-Paul, uh, uh, who I had assisted for uh, uh, teaching when, while she was teaching uh, a Montreal studio at, in the early 2000s, uh, had accepted being the curator for the show, we discussed different forms this could take. One point of departure was, to, was that we were somewhat quite, we prided ourselves as an office on actually having built a fair proportion of our projects. And so we decided to concentrate just on a few projects in the exhibition, four or five projects. We might add up then that we had been somewhat um, relatively discreet also at promoting our practice up to that point. Once we had agreed on that basic prom premise of keeping it to a few buildings, we could have chosen to document just one type of projects, for example, housing projects, or renovation projects, or cultural and leisure facilities, and these are uh, shots of the website of the office. Uh, a more interesting possibility that we entertained for a while was to compare projects of vastly different scales. So here you have some um, structure up north for Hydro-Quebec to observe for tourists who want to observe the dams in, at James Bay, and at the bottom, a one kilometer long uh, hydroelectric power plant on the east side of Montreal uh, in Beauharnois, just along the St. Lawrence Seaway. So that would, could have been one way to go. Sorry, but in the end, uh, Marie-Paul and uh, us, and we are four partners, I should at least mention them, Robert Mang, Michel Lapointe, Benoit Forcy, and myself, um, agreed instead to document projects to tackle one way or another the current condition of the city, be it urban or suburban, and assess to what extent the projects under review had tried to mend the contemporary city. The result is the exhibition on display here and the monograph with Marie-Paul's essay, Dialogues with the Transformative City, which gives a title to the exhibition as well. The organization of the lecture, however, will be a bit different since it's our first time here in Waterloo, and I've chosen to show more projects than those uh, that are in the exhibition, daring to bring out sometimes a few old projects, whereas architects tend to prefer to show just what's on their boards. Um, and, and through that, I'll try to hint at some of the other topics that could have been covered by this exhibition. One reason, finally, for this choice has to do with the type of commissions we get, which are mostly public buildings, and this is important. And this means that when eventually in Montreal you could all visit those buildings, they are easily accessible. 
for, I believe it is quite one thing to glance at images or show images or watch images on the net. Another to hear the architect talk about the project, but finally the most important thing is if people actually visit the project and this remains paramount, I think, to our experiencing, our learning curve in architecture. We have to visit the project. So I'll go on with the project, there'll be about 10 projects, um, and the, pro the, the presentation will be divided more or less in five parts. So just to start with briefly, two projects that we're defining for the office. Uh, the first one is the McCord Museum of Canadian History, built in 1992. It was, was to con coincide with the 350th anniversary of the city of Montreal, and it was an unlikely commission that we would get that. We ne had never done a museum before, uh, and the institution was somewhat a fairly conservative institution. We managed to get the contract, and um, it marked for the office uh, a, a turning points because at that point, the four current uh, partners started really working together and designing together. Um, obviously, a museum is a choice commission. Just a few, few brief, brief words. I should have said that this will, um, the, the part here is a Percy Nobbs building. The intent here was to blend new and uh, um, existing building. The original building, which was, was a Percy Nobbs building, had been gutted in the 1960s, so nothing remained inside. So we introduced kind of a loop around the exhibition so that always you would be going back and forth from uh, current to new construction to existing construction. And we somewhat, being young designers at the time, we somewhat indulge, I would say, in um, the craft of putting together pro uh, uh, materials, uh, stone, wood, glass. So we, there was a lot going on in terms of um, experiment for ourselves in that project. And in a way, the, the office for a while was defined by this kind of work, whereas eventually, be, just because of the public commissions we got, we somewhat uh, oriented ourselves into a kind of more direct approach to design with relying a bit less on uh, these kinds of details that we enjoy very much designing. However, for example, I just showed this because all these furniture are either sliding or pivoting, and so we took great fun in designing these things. The second project is the Bain l'Evêque, and this is also a very small project. It's a pool house in the Plateau Mont-Royal, which is a kind of a former uh, working class neighborhood that's been gentrified. You have the original structure, of 1909, and this the uh, what the building looked like when you took it over. It had been transformed by the 1950s. And what's interesting about this series of work, we did a lot of renovation of pools, uh, small pools like that, up to 19, uh, the end of 1990s. The city was in the habit of selling these bats because they they weren't not the pools. They were not up to par, and they were too small and um, preferred engaging into larger programs of school construction, but the neighborhoods objected vehemently to that. And that was the first pool that kind of stopped that, uh, that trend in the city, and they decided to renovate. But when you took over the project, uh, you could not have um, both sexes at the same time. There was just one changing room, for example, so you, there was a lot of upgrades to do. So this was handed us as an upgrade project, and we really tried to make an urban intervention out of that. That what remains of the building, and uh, I'll show you why I show you this eventually by the by the end of the, the small topics on, on that project. Um, and so what we did is that we created at the corner. We felt that the previous building didn't address at all the corner situation, so we created kind of the, this little raised plaza that takes up the ramp also for the handicap, and so that parents could eventually wait for the children, read outside while people are are uh, in the pool. Um, and also crafting the materials quite um, uh, with great care, I would say. Introduce new materials in terms at least, not new materials, brick is very pervasive in that neighborhood, but new colors of bricks. And um, the project, with some, some interiors also, uh, I'll just stay with that. The project met with opposition. That's what's important about the project. Okay, because it felt, the, some citizen felt it was too contemporary. The city eventually allowed us to build this, and in fact, we received an orange prize from a heritage conservation uh, agency, say, Save Montreal. And it, since a lot of architects lived in that neighborhood, and a lot of public servants also lived in that neighborhood, it helped a lot, a lot of our firms also just to get contemporary intervention and good quality work for small projects get through now to the city. So it, 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 it became kind of a, 
Uh, it's a project, a very small project, where, but at least once a month, somebody that I'll bump into by chance will talk about that project. So small but very important, very defining. The, uh, the, show, the, the slide I showed you where you saw how much we demolished, just uh, I, I put it there because I want to just mention one thing. That's, it's difficult to evaluate how people will remember the spaces and evaluate the new spaces. So we were very surprised. We were intent on recreating the main hall of the pool. So this is the original one, the one when we took the project and the renovated one. And what's striking is how many people also would say, I recognize my pool, even though you rebuilt it completely. And so this, the, 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 this, the, I talked about the two students today about that. The, the, you have to consider how people will relate to these spa spaces and also can they, they project themselves into their spaces. But it's very strange how sometimes it doesn't take much for them to still relate, you know. So this was a, an, uh, an important project. The second part of the lecture comes out of um, an observation Marie-Paul made uh, when we started working on the exhibition, and she, she was saying how, this is a subway map of Montreal, and she was saying, she found it amazing how many times we had worked either designing a metro station or building over a metro station or around a metro station, and yet we had not registered that, in fact, but so she pointed that out. So we did, uh, in fact, seven projects in the last 20 years around metro station. Uh, the first one is uh, of Saint-Michel. In fact, that was built in the mid-80s. That was the last, that's a very old project, obviously. Well, very old, 30 years old. But it's the last metro station that was built in Montreal for 30 years before the extension towards Laval. And that's, that's, the office did that um, 30 years ago. That was one of the first projects, I would say, of Michel Lapointe and Robert Mang on designing on their own. The second project I want to show is the Centre Bell, which is straddling Lucien Lallier and Bonaventure. That's probably the most um, best known, perhaps, project, not necessarily by its architect, but just by, <laughs> by virtue of its function. Um, this is built uh, in a right downtown, just south of St. Catherine Street, which is a busy commercial city. Um, you have a commuter train station coming to the west side. Uh, the former Windsor station is here. You have the expressway going underground at this point, so the, the, the building eventually is on, right on axis as you go east. And uh, what's, I'll try to concentrate just on a few brief points for each project. So what's important about this project, one of the main important things is that it, it had nothing to do with our involvement with the, with the project was the decision of the team to stay in the city. This was uh, paramount, they wanted to stay downtown, and it was counter to all uh, trends in, the North, in North America. And in, in order to, do, to be able to do that, they, they, they bought this land, uh, which was a bit narrow for the kind of bowl that was common in the National Hockey League, and they said, well, we'll have just a tighter bowl, we really want to be downtown, and this was a much more complex project, you can imagine, than if you had built in a suburban location. So the, the client should be credited for that. Now, the reason why they built also is that it's for these two rings, which are the corporate boxes. Okay, that's what makes the money in any sports field, in any sports team. Okay, so that's basically why they decided to move there. Obviously, the aims of the and just to, this perspective uh, shows uh, uh, an eventual tower that was not built. And this is the just to locate some people who might know Montreal. This is Windsor Station. Okay, the aims of the architects, however, are somewhat slightly different, I must say. So our aim was to make this very big building fit in the city and have it as porous as possible, even though it was mostly a private building. So I just indicate uh, a few of the design moves that we'd made. So it's linked, the dotted lines show the links to the Bonaventure metro station and to the Lucien Lallier. So we insisted that it had to be linked both ends of the metros. The other thing is that we wanted, for example, to a commuter train passenger to be able to go around inside the building, uh, yeah, inside the building, take the former shed of the Windsor Station metro station and get into Windsor Station. So they have, uh, they, they, they are in contact, even though they don't come necessarily into the arena, they, they are in contact with the arena. There were also important north-south links, so if you were going from 
the commercial portion of the downtown, you could go through the commuter train station and then go down here and emerge on St. Antoine and get further south because it has to be said that there's a three-story difference between north and south. This allowed us also to hide the loading dock under the tracks. So this is one of the big problems in the city when you have huge for sporting facilities, how they handle all the, the trucks, et cetera, that are quite unpleasing in terms of urban integration. The other big move was the east north, the second northwest passage here and the creation of this court we, that we have called the Windsor Court and that, we, that would establish a dialogue between the, the, the forum itself and the Windsor Station. We broke up the mass of the building by using a brick area, curtain wall. Here you have one of the north-south passageway always open, so it, even though it's a private building, you can go through uh, the area uh, adjacent to it. Uh, this is a big sloping wall that gives onto the, um, the, the um, concourse of the arena and this way towards the Windsor Station. Some sh uh, photographs of uh, the uh, circulation area, also glazed, which is something that's quite unusual in arenas because usually uh, this is also used for concerts, so usually um, the clients prefer to have as little as natural as possible uh, natural light inside, but they agree to have, because of the urban situation, to have fairly glazed openings. This is the commuter station. And just finally, um, not a very good photograph, I'm sorry, but I wanted to show the Windsor Court and this, uh, we felt always, you know, when you design building, you're projecting some potential into them. The clients then decide to use it as they wish. So we had always wished that this court would be used for concert, for uh, public events and things like that, and never materialized. Uh, a lot of people would be using it at lunchtime, but beyond that, uh, we had, we had, uh, we had, uh, there's some fretted glass here, so in fact you could do projection, but never, the client never went into, into that possibility, and that was a kind of a disappointment. Um, the other thing uh, to mention is that you, you don't have control uh, necessarily to how things will develop, but uh, the master plan called for two towers uh, to be built. Uh, we never, ne nothing came of it, but then finally, 15 years later, they broke ground on the two towers just last fall. So here you'll have an office building that will be rising just here. And beyond there, you'll be the, having this residential tower for um, condos. We're not involved in any of these two towers, but uh, we're, we, we were discussing this and saying, well, perhaps it bring a bit more um, uh, activities into the court, but nonetheless, the court is always accessible for the people. Uh, just, to, just to show so that this is all connected to the underground, tourists are always fascinated by the Montreal underground, and our Nuit Blanche, the same that uh, is happening in Toronto in the, in the fall, in Montreal is happening all underground, all the art installation are underground. The other project is the ITHQ, the Institut de Tourisme et d'Hôtellerie du Québec. It's over Sherbrooke Metro Station. Uh, another very dense situation, Saint-Denis Street is kind of a historic commercial street. It faces, the institute is here, you can see it's fairly dense. Uh, Sherbrooke Street is just here. Uh, and it's fronting Square Saint-Louis, which is a very important square in, uh, in, in, in Montreal. A lot of cultural figures of the beginning of the 20th century lived there. Um, this is the, the building we inherited, which is a typically, as Marie-Paul mentioned in her essay, a kind of a 60s uh, brutalist building, built in 1974, received the first Lemon Prize that the same, uh, government, the same body that gave us an Orange Prize for the Belle Vague, they gave the first uh, Lemon Prize for this building. And the, um, the commission basically uh, wanted to, and you can see just by looking at the building, obviously you see there's very some unusual features, so you can make out that there's two uh, mechanical floors, because they're, it's, it's a demonstration hotel and a restaurant. That is, that's where people learn their craft in, for the restaurant and hotel industry. Um, um, just to mention, uh, yeah, just... Uh, the, 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 the commission specifically had two components, upgrade the projects, but also change completely its appearance. We can understand why. Okay, so what we did is that we, um, we decided to basically wrap the building with the one base treatment and one the squat tower would receive another treatment. And you have some of the sketches. Eventually, we, um, it was our first try also at a low-tech, 
double skin facade. So on the south side, which you see in the model here, on the three other sides, you'll see it's expanded metal, but on the main facade, it's glass facade, and the idea was that cool air would be sucked in here in this space, the gap between the existing wall and the new facade would be heated up by the south uh, so the uh, south sun and western sun and then get sucked in by the in air intake because there's a lot of changing of the uh, air intakes because of the commercial kitchens involved. And we were able to do some um, uh, samples also, on-site samples in terms of the treatment and here you can see uh, we were experimenting for the base with clear and frosted glass and you'll see eventually the uh, upper part for the tower. The second move we did was to uh, correct some of the decision that had been made in terms of planning. Uh, for example, this there's a very very sought after restaurant in that building. It was hidden on the sixth floor. The hotel lobby was completely, um, mostly uh, opaque to the street. Uh, there was a huge space on the last floor, which was uh, a gymnasium, double heights gymnasium that command, could have commanded a great view of the city, but they had no windows, for example. So one of the things, the, one, the, the few th first things we did was bring down the restaurant on St. Denis Street. And we also opened up the lobby. Uh, so this is all glazed now. And this is important because this is the entrance to Metro Station, the Sherbrooke Metro Station. So this is the existing, what w was before, and how we transformed that just by adding completely clear glass so you see the activities of the hotel lobby. So to, in order to relate to the city, you see, you, you have to give, it, you give back to the pedestrian as well as the user of the building. Some shots of the inside. It was a very cavernous, very dark brown building. Now it's much more lighter in color, it's cheerful. And on, we transformed the gymnasium into offices that made big openings into that southern facade, looking uh, southwest facade, overlooking the the square, the square, and this is the uh, kind of a, the pleated glass facade that uh, we create on that side with clear glass, and the returns are um, uh, green tint color, so that with the setting sun it illuminates the facade, um, and a few very telling uh, shots of how the building was transformed. One. Small technical notes is that um, the exterior uh, uh, walls were made of concrete block, but the structure could not accommodate if we were to change the metal siding and had decided, for example, to use brick or masonry or precast or whatever, the structure could not have hold on to, to the, that weight. So it informed our decision to go for a very lightweight material because otherwise, the, because a lot of people wanted this to become kind of a stone building or brick building, obviously. Um, and we felt that this was not anyway the, the, the way to go because we didn't feel that we could hide the volume, basically. We wanted to make it just more um, simple. Um, and so uh, to, since the building was also in use throughout the uh, construction, we decided to keep the concrete block so it prevented us from having to demolish some exterior uh, walls. And this is now the facade onto uh, the Square Saint Louis. So the restaurant is revealed also by a slight curve on this, underneath the, top, the, the base. The entrance is um, it's kind of marked by this sculpture and also by uh, a surround, a yellow uh, surround. You can see also the use of uh, super graphics. And he, this is the pleated accordion like uh, curtain wall. And, um, does that, and on this side, what we did also, we brought out, uh, because there's two stories of a hotel room, so in order to, this is the only part that interrupts the skin of the, of the project, and, um, and we created balconies so that you command views of the city from these hotel rooms. And so the skin here is just uh, normal industrial safety grip panels that are all bolted together, pre-assembled, painted in, in, this, in, um, in the shop, and then just uh, hoisted uh, up to, uh, uh, to reclad completely the building. And this also allowed us to do some kind of a detail uh, a patterning where we didn't have any constraint in terms of uh, illumination, because once again, a lot of, of the, the, the spaces behind are opaque for technical reason. And the base here, of the um, of the tower with the original window placement, just a fairly cheap uh, metal behind, uh, kind of an array of a changing pattern of glass, fretted glass, um, 
so frosted glass, clear glass, and also the, the, the location of the glass within the window, uh, the, the, within the mullion also changes, and a gap here to identify the metro station. Uh, just a, a few, a quick word, just to say that uh, we always consider how the building will be seen at night. Our buildings will be seen at night. It's an important component in our Nordic climate. Um, and uh, so uh, we're trying always to, to consider how it will be re read at night. Um, continuing on those metro station intervention, uh, here the Geek, at Guy Concordia, the only thing I want to mention is that this is the, the site that we inherited uh, in the, from another point of view. I just want to mention this because the, this was a corner site, the small edicule, the small station used to be there. And the idea when they built the station in the 1960s was that these lots would become very profitable for the, um, the Société de Transport for the, for, because developers would want to be right over the metro. In fact, it never materialized, and a lot of these sites remain empty for years. And it's only like 20 years down the, 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 the road that some promoters began to become interested in, uh, in building uh, over these lots because there were they, they were so, so many constraints that it was just too expensive, and there were cheaper lots available. So another case in point is this project I'll spend more time on, is the Résidence Alfredo Gagliardi on Jean Talon Market, uh, Jean Talon uh, Metro Station, very close to Jean Talon market, market, which is the most important market in Montreal. This is our site here. This is still uh, St. Denis Street. And here the challenges were that, uh, in this, the, the, the parcel is an L-shaped uh, form. This is Saint Denis and this is Jean Talon. And here the challenge is that we had to build over a metro station, a laneway, a, um, a right of way, a, a tunnel by the metro station also, and an underground garage. So a lot of challenges for social housing because this is social housing. The program is a very innovative so, uh, program. It, it's pe people um, get services, so they, they have meals served to them. It comes with their rent, but they also have a small kitchen so at night they can prepare their own meal. So there's some independence, but at the same time, a lot of sociability. And you might think that there's a lot of redundancy in terms of services in that program, but in fact, it's, it's extremely popular, extremely um, good at keeping people home in, or in apartments as opposed to be going to an institution. So what we did is that we created a, a commercial space on the ground to animate this building. Uh, you have the metro station and also you have directly accessible units from the street, which is somewhat rare because usually the organization, the institution prefer to have just one point of entry, but we convinced them that it was better to have kind of a presence on the street. Um, uh, in order to make it viable, these projects, you have to have a fair amount of, of uh, apartments. So when we were handed the commission, uh, it was 65 for 65 uh, apartment. In the end, we built 95 because otherwise it was not viable. So we had to negotiate with the city from going from a five to a six-story building on Jean Talon and from a three to a four-story building on um, uh, Berry Street. So obviously, we're trying to kind of mitigate the effect, the effect of the volume with respect to the neighbors. Whereas as architect, we weren't very concerned about that, I must admit, but the city was. Um, one of the important things in, to, in, the, in order to be well integrated in the city, we have to take into account, for example, that one of the rallying point of occupants is what they can see. And so here you have a building, a very simple, straightforward, double-loaded corridor. We are occupying 100% of the lot, but we've been uh, very uh, adamant at creating views into the neighborhood and uh, allowing the, uh, the people who used to live probably in two, in duplexes or triplexes, now they, build in a, they live in a higher building so they can take advantage of the view. So we were very conscious into uh, maintaining very nice views. So from the dining room you have views onto the commercial street. Here from the upper balconies of these apartments you, you see the Mont, uh, Mont Royal, the Mount Royal, which is kind of the, one of the rallying or identifying points in the landscape of Montreal, and you have, we have also introduced a communal balconies. This was not wished for or asked for the by the client, but we were adamant that it was an opportunity to put some communal facilities so people can watch the sunset and see the Laurentians, some steeples also. So these views we felt were extremely important for the uh, people. Um, 
how the building relates to the scale. So you can see that it's a bigger building than the rest, but then at the same time, there's some alignments that we've taken up. On St. Denis Street, I must say, we had to juggle with all kinds of setback uh, uh, that were um, imposed by the city. And on the, this is a laneway, so uh, these uh, ground apartments are um, double, have double in orientation. Uh, even though we are occupying 100% of the parcel, 25% uh, of the, uh, the, um, the apartment have double orientation, which is not easily uh, achieved when you have a single loaded corridor kind of a principle. And uh, what's interesting also is that these apartments which we're giving onto the lane were not the most popular, but in fact, um, so they were not chosen by the occupants first, but those are the apartments that get the best orientation and the best views because they see Mont Royal, the Mount Royal. So that, that goes to show that um, uh, what seems detrimental sometimes, bordering a lane, can in fact be mitigated by views, by uh, exposure, sun exposure, etc. And just to complete that, just a small look at one of the study that we're doing. So. Um, once you've done one type of building, sometimes you get pigeonholed. Um, at other times, you were quite happy that they asked you again to, to work on a similar program. Here, because we had done the Jean Talon uh, housing project, they asked us to look at this Rosemont site, which is as challenging as the other one. So an uh, uh, aerial view sorry, of the uh, site. That's quite interesting because this, here you have, this is St. Denis Street again. So we're building all, sorry, all along uh, St. Denis Street. Um, so this is an industrial, used to be a uh, garment industry where in those buildings. Um, this is the metro station set back from the street. This is Rosemont Street. And here you'll see uh, there's a overpass going to into another neighborhood. So both these intersections, this one and this one, mark the shifting from one neighborhood to the other one. Here we're in Rosemont. We're going to Milan. We're going to the Plateau Mont Royal. And the site used to house a uh, workshop for the city of Montreal. They cleared that site uh, just six years ago, and the development has been quite a, a success because six, it usually takes more time than that in Montreal to fill up a whole block, but then six years later, we've been working on that city for at least six years, and since then, all this has gone up. This, this is a condo, this is co-ops, this is a library that's going up by Dan Anginu. And this was the only building that was still there. And it's operated by the same agency, public agency, that has asked us to look at that site. So the constraints are that the station has to stay, in, that's the only exit for that station. It has to remain in place all through the construction. And here we have a bus terminal loop, and um, there have been studies within the last two years to try to relocate it. It's impossible, so basically what we have to do is build over this. So this is a view from the overpass looking east. I'll just go rapidly just to show what the consideration we're taking into account. So a, a very constricted site because uh, there's so much activities that cannot be moved around. Uh, also, uh, we had to consider access for loading docks, uh, access to parking also, uh, very little ways to, to get into a parking. So what we're proposing, in fact, is using the parking of the adjacent building, punching the foundation, and linking to our parking. Uh, obviously, the, the bus um, uh, loop that has to be maintained, and also the neighborhood uh, mayor, and uh, the, because we're the arrondissement, which is the way the, the, the city is structured, wanted to have a kind of a setback uh, for the building. So just some, just to show a bit how we worked, so we worked in models a lot, um, tried different configuration. At one point, we initially we thought we could do away with tile building on the, the loop. It proved impossible. So it meant that the cost of the building will be higher, so it means that you have to have more units. So we started out at 120 units. We're now at 200 units. And the, luckily, we have two kinds of programs here. Uh, we have families and old age people, so each have its own entrance, so it allows us to have two circulation banks, and we're pivoting the two bars and creating a hole so that the mass of the building will be less uh, imposing on the street side. So on the street, on the St. Denis side, we'll have a higher building, creating kind of a gate with the existing building. This one that's, I would say, bound within the next 10 years to change occupation and they'll be reclining for sure, so the, the look of it will be somewhat different, and opening the views towards the neighborhood and the library that's put going on. 
just the plants, the two bars, the gap I was identifying, and this gap uh, gives a view onto uh, Mount Royal once again. So this is what we wanted to emphasize. A few shots of just the working model, the gap once again, the view basically that I showed in, at the beginning and how it, look, it would look with the building sitting over the, uh, the bus level. So this was uh, a series of uh, intervention in the city, um, but we were confronted uh, with another problem or no, other challenges, how to be urban but in a very small town. So this is a courthouse in Salaberry de Valley Field, which is east of Montreal, a town of about 40,000 people. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly nice town, however, not very prosperous, so it means that its building have been kept. <laughs> That's the irony very often of those type of, of cities. Uh, water is obviously very present into the city. Uh, it has a cathedral, so it, it's a quite a nice setting. The building is here. Uh, there's an original part that you'll see that dates from 1901, and it had been expanded uh, in 1975 at the back. And it's fronting one of the uh, first square of uh, the city of Valley Field, okay? Um, the problem was that uh, it's close to the border, so there's a lot of criminal activity in this, in this sector. So the program calls for doubling, basically, the courthouse, um, which is a bit strange when you'll see the building and I'm telling you that it's only a 40,000 uh, people um, city, you'll, you'll, have, you'll have problem reconciling the size of the building, but that's how it uh, that's the, the, the condition. So basically what uh, happened is the city and the uh, Ministry of Justice agreed to block off, there used to be a street here, and they blocked off the street and gave the land to, to build the, the, uh, uh, the, um, the addition. This is the original building, how it was when we uh, took it uh, four years ago, obviously. Um, windows had been changed, it had been once again also completely gutted, nothing remained inside of this structure. Um, this is uh, fronting the park I was talking about, so a very nice setting however, but what's bizarre, um, not, not bizarre, but um, unfortunate, uh, another brutalist structure was put up in 1975, uh, and you can see also all the apparatus that's grafted onto these buildings just to, to bring um, the detainees to the courtroom, and so it changes completely. You know, when you're talking a courthouse, you're, you're thinking civic buildings, things like that, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it has to function, and often what you graft onto them destroys their character, be it by new construction or by uh, just services. So this is basically the party that we took. Uh, we wanted to keep the verticality of the original courthouse as the dominant feature, and we decided to basically gut the 1975 building, remain, keep the structure, and then add on on the, west, on the other side, the west side, but just create one counterpoint to the 1901 building and just a continuous um, envelope of, uh, of different type of glass over a, a brick uh, building. We were adamant, although the Ministry of Justice was saying the main entrance is, and the official entrance is from the parking side, and we all reconciled with the fact that in our cities, especially small cities, people travel by car, we wanted to keep a dignified entrance on the park sides, and that's why we integrated a winter garden at the front of the rectangular box, so that the, it felt like the park was coming into the courthouse also. So this is a plan, the, the park is here, and where there used to be the street is now the main circulation uniting the parking side and the park side of the building with the winter garden here in blue, just a few of the courthouses, the courtrooms, sorry, in the building. Um, in the upper floor where the, you'll have the judges and the uh, lawyers, uh, we created also a, um, a terraced uh, uh, garden on the roof so that visually when you're working here, what you see is uh, the, this roof, this green roof, as an extension also of the park that's further here. Construction uh, photograph, the building is not yet finished, and it's being built also in phases, as in the Institut de Tourisme et d'Hôtellerie, so all through the process, uh, activities were still maintained, so this complicates obviously the, the project. The entrance to the park, so it's kind of a funnel shape that concentrates people in between the new part and the existing part, the new windows that we put in for the uh, 1901 structure. 
sorry. And uh, the envelope, once again, at the back, uh, the parking side, uh, we decided to have a series of very, to accentuate the verticality, very narrow bays, uh, and three type of uh, facing, either clear glass, frosted glass, or opaque panels, and very deep mullions so that um, here you have uh, the condition before the mullions are in and you will see afterwards in perspective sometimes you complete the, the, the clear or, or uh, frosted uh, panes completely disappear and just see kind of a continuous wall. Uh, schizophrenic con condition while we were building the new part, the, con the 1975 part, so it elicited a lot of comments from the citizens who were wondering what was going on. Um, so a few shots of where the building is at now. It's almost finished. You can see that we try to maintain also a fairly low building, just three-story high, basically not higher than the existing 1901 building. Um, touch of color from the park side comes back uh, on the parking side to uh, signify that this is one entrance also. And, uh, and you can see that eventually all you see is kind of a, a wall a, 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 of mid-gray, uh, Mulligans. This is the uh, position uh, uh, when of the entrance before we built it. Now, when you come out, you don't see it very clearly, but, but at the end here, it, the diagonal, the angle of the winter garden points to the cathedral. So when you come out, you see the cathedral of Saint, uh, Valley Field. And this is kind of the landscaping also that, that you would have here that extend the park towards the entrance here some views of unfinished spaces. Uh, this is the winter garden going up. This is an artwork by uh, Lisette Lemieux. Uh, I mention it because uh, um, when, she did the, when she presented the project, her, her concept was uh, these were kind of an olive branch and uh, they symbolize reconciliation. And we, when we think about uh, a courthouse, we tend to think about decisions, you know, somebody is condemned and this and that. And her take was, well, this is a place where we have to come midpoint also. It's an interesting thing because, because this project has been going on for the last three years and in phases, I visited this building in operation countless times. And I must say I had never been as often in a courtroom before or a courthouse. And uh, I... At the beginning, I was saying, you know, this is a civic building. It has to have a certain dignity, sure enough. But, in fact, it resembles less a city hall than a social uh, center, you know. And you realize being there that people who are very often brought to justice is because they are either sick or they have psychological problems. And so it's, it's people in need. So that's a, a lesson that we have to remember. And this is the... Uh, circulation space I was talking about, and uh, we emphasize the staircase, so inside people, they just have to go one story to go to the other court, uh, court room, so uh, we dignified the, uh, the elevators, so I, at least most people would use the, 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 the staircase, sorry, not the elevators. And this will be finished uh, next June. Um, the fourth category is, uh, we call that periurbain, which is Another nicer word than for being suburban, basically. Um, and the uh, first uh, project is the Centre Sportif de Gatineau. So what do you do when you don't really have a context? You know, it's not urban even in a small town. It's, it's just half of it. So you see the, the site plan, very little construction around there. Okay? Just to uh, perhaps situate or locate some of you, these are the national archives uh, that was done uh, in the, I guess, by... Uh, by whom, who, who did that, Icoi? Uh, uh, Icoi did that in the mid 80s, I guess, or something like that. Uh, the context, so, you know, typical, you know, this is our site. This is, you know, in the literature, this is supposed to, to be a new downtown. And so that, that's the idea of, you know, if you'll create activities by having office buildings like that. Um, you have some cultural venue. This is the Maison de la Culture, the cultural center and the library. Not a very nice architecture. Uh, this is the college. Obviously, the photo don't do it justice, but it's, they're, they're fairly cheap buildings anyway. So you see the context. So what do you do there? So we, the commission is for building a, a large 50-meter uh, pool and a triple gymnasium. And so our take was to make this a very simple project, but kind of a destination project, so that people would spend time, even if they don't 
participate in the activities uh, of the pool or the, um, the gymnasium, at least, uh, they are encouraged to stare around. And uh, we, we created kind of the scenario, this is the uh, eventual lead, there'll be a bus terminal here. So we created conceptually this, this uh, path in between the pool, the gymnasium, and created from the excavation mounts, so a new landscape that would be, uh, um, that so that people coming from the bus could go through here and eventually either stay in the, at the sports center or cr go across the street, go to the cultural center and the library, or go across this way and go to the college. So that was kind of the scenario we constructed. This is the uh, passage uh, level, what we call the traverse. So uh, you come here from the bus, bus terminal, and so you would go up, and you have this kind of narrow mezzanine suspended above a double height space, and so you have no control, so you're completely free to enter the building and just go through it uh, if you please, or stay and go into the bleachers on each side. And basically the big volumes are um, framed by two L-shaped uh, uh, structure, each with its own defining color, one very dark, one very light. So you have for the gymnasium a light gray, for the pool dark gray, and then we're playing with colorful glass to animate that space, and we're glazing as much as possible also. So if we, to go through the traverse, the passageway, so this is coming from the cultural center, you go up, you have the, ent the main entrance, usually people will come from this part, and uh, you get into the mezzanine that I was talking about, that's completely free of access, and then you emerge towards the bus station in this kind of landscape where all the excav excavation was um, uh, transformed into a, a landscape of berms and mounts and an installation also in Corton by Francine Darrivé, which is a sculptor. And some of the views you get inside, so uh, maximize that nat natural lighting, uh, a lot of clear glass at the landscape level and translucent uh, glazing above, so to have as much natural light as possible. And in the gymnasium, the same kind of principle. But one thing you have to remember when you do a, a lot of um, uh, uh, glazed surfaces, it's likely that you have to give the opportunity to the client to also to close it off. So it's a give and take, okay? And um, second to last project, the National Circus School. This is a um, uh, a school, another very peculiar school, I talked about the uh, Institut de Tourisme et d'Hôtellerie, which is a kind of a demonstration school. This one is a school where performers uh, for the circus uh, learn their trade. Um, uh, very few schools like that in the world, there's like six or seven. So it means that there's uh, also students from all over the world that come to that school. It's a, a high school and college level. Uh, it's next. To, uh, so you can see that also it's a, it's a urban uh, context that uh, somewhat fragmented. Here you still have a fairly regular uh, residential construction. This is the expressway that li uh, links Quebec City to Ottawa. So it's a really kind of in the imagination of the people. This is kind of the uh, north boundary to the city, and beyond that you're very far. And it's next to a quarry also that used. It used to be a quarry, it was transformed into a dump for 35 years, then closed, and now they're trying to transform that, this into an environmental park. Um, so the context here is uh, somewhat uh, still to be defined, at least that's what our take was on the, this project. It was a competition, There's some views of the quarry, and this is a view from the expressway, and when we entered the competition, we uh, approached it not so much questioning how what should a circus school look like but rather how can we make this an urban project how can it speak to the city because the uh, I should have mentioned that um, the I'll just go back to the um, the government had encouraged the Cirque du Soleil which is well known to locate its headquarters here okay and the school is completely independent from the Cirque du Soleil it, it, its foundation predates the Cirque du Soleil but obviously the government wanted to to use the circus industry to kind of develop this leftover space in the city so but the Cirque du Soleil was set back from the street it's very low, low uh, uh, well relatively low building so the neighborhood which 
was known as the Cité des Arts du Cirque, like this circus neighborhood had no identity in the imagination of the people. So our take was, okay, this school should be able to bring forth that this is where the area in the city where the circus industry is uh, being uh, developed. And so we came up with the idea of stacking up and we asked ourselves, how can we go vertical? How, how can the program justify that? And we decided to stack up the three gymnasium they were asking for in the program rather than play around with images of tent-like structure and things like that, which are more commonplace in circus uh, uh, activities. So, the, the, so this was the mo working model. You can see these uh, sketches showing how we, we wanted to stack up the, the gymnasium. And the idea at that point was that they would be kind of a, not all aligned one above the other. So we would allude to the um, kind of the uh, equilibrium, a, preca a preca precarious equilibrium that the jugglers have to deal with. Also induce with vertical uh, um, spaces the, the, the notion of vertical that's associated very often with their performances. And so what we did is uh, basically a rectangular building uh, set off from the city grid, city grid because no building really addressed that, 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 that street anyway. And so by turning it off, we, um, uh, we, uh, we were directly facing south. And we also, once again, uh, in the direction of the Mount Royal, uh, it also, uh, in, in terms of analogy, by doing that, it meant that we, you were kind of uh, going up a gangway before reaching the, the school. So you were kind of leaving the world of the city and getting into the universe of the circus metaphorically. Uh, obviously, since we're uh, directly south, then we have uh, a series of bris soleil. And the all-important sectional perspective that, that tells how we organize this, so we stacked up the build building, the big, the, sorry, the big uh, gymnasiums. And on the other side, we, we added all the um, academic, uh, administrative, uh, library, all the functions that are part of that school. So they, they will follow school, uh, classes of English or French, philosophy, mathematics, physics. And uh, the party was to open, to glaze this so that when you're into the classroom or where, when, when you're a secretary or when you're a librarian, you can still see the activities that are going on in the rehearsal spaces. This was a, a kind of a um, gageure, I don't know how we say that. It was uh, uh, because to go vertically obviously was not the way the client uh, had expected when he wrote his program and it, it, they were quite daring in choosing that project, in fact among the six finalists. So when you're on the upper plateau, uh, you have this kind of condition where you have one rehearsal space beyond another one, and here you have what we call the hive, where you have all these uh, um, four meter high spaces, the library, the labs, here you have the administration that can look over, and here the glazing at the end of this hall looks into uh, directly south towards Mo uh, Montreal. So we felt that also in terms of the um, foreign students, it would be interesting that even though they're so far removed from the center of the city, they still had a sense that they belong to the city of Montreal. Um, this is the uh, plan for uh, when you enter, so you have kind of the gangway and you, you reach kind of a plateau and from there you have the cafeteria and you overlook once again rehearsal spaces like this. A lot of glazing inside. Uh, when we proposed that initially we didn't know that but in fact it, they, they were perfectly open to that idea because for them one of the things that they have to teach the performers is to be completely at ease while being continuously watched or in performance and things like that. So for them, that corridors be glazed towards rehearsal spaces was a, a very, very uh, important feature. Also, uh, it's a bit like uh, in architecture school before computers, that is. Uh, we used to spend a lot of time in studios and these gymnasts 
spend their lives there, basically. So they wanted the, the gymnasium, the, uh, the, the teachers wanted them to be well lit with natural light. So we always have clear glass and then translucent glass above to reduce the glare. And also have kind of, I was thinking, I was talking before how we consider always the light, light, night lighting, also the effect of the inside. So the filigree uh, effect, how the structure is also revealed through that translucent material outside. And um, this is a, a shot of the model that's in the exhibition. Um, at the uh, competition time, we had imagined a low bar here also. Uh, and in fact, because of budget reason, it was not built. But uh, the school proved fairly successful, I must say. So just six years later, they asked us to add some residences for their high schoolers. And also, the other thing is, uh, so basically the image is very close to what we had envisioned initially. The other thing that uh, uh, we had thought about was that they didn't have much land. Uh, and so by going vertical, they were using less of their land and uh, thinking if ever there's a need of future, ex future expansion, they would still have land available. And in fact, they built just another huge uh, studio. Just uh, We completed that just two years ago. So it proved that our intuition were, played out quite well as time developed. And so we didn't play too much with color outside, the, uh, the, the way that the building uh, uh, would be kind of joyous as a circus, but at night, all the colors that are inside come through to this abundant uh, glazing. And you can see, you know, uh, performers dangling from cords and things like that when you go by uh, the neighboring streets. Sorry, and the last project is a project that's not built. It's the Maison de la Danse. Uh, we come back to Montreal. I just wanted to show uh, one project that's on the board. Uh, this is uh, Place des Arts, downtown Montreal, once again, St. Catherine Street. Um, and this is our site, which is, uh, you'll see it's an industrial building that's been renovated, that will, will, will be renovating. Um, you might have n uh, heard about the Place des Festivals, which is this uh, area, so the, the it has been transformed the last three years by uh, René Daou uh, from Daou Le Stade with a whole bunch of uh, other consultants. And this is where most of the activities, some activities of the festival will take place now. And uh, what, what that means is that this building, which used to be an industrial building fronting only on the other side, on the Bleury side, now is being exposed on all its sides. So the program uh, is one of how do you, how you change the reading of that because this become prime space in the city, basically. And, uh, and we were, uh, the program calls for um, housing many different companies relating to dance. So you have the Grand Ballet Canadien, you have two other dance company, um, that, not, not company, but that will welcome different dance company. You have a dance school and you'll also have some offices. So, Basically, the, pro, the, 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 the concept was that we would house in the uh, Wilder building, this is the name of the building, uh, which is an L-shaped building. We would house all the functions that are offices or change rooms, things like that, and we would build south and north these two extensions, with, which would have the, stu the big rehearsal spaces, you know, double height or triple height spaces, and that needed more acrobatics in terms of uh, structure, let's say, so, and keep all the fairly simple um, um, functions within the Wilder building. Obviously, um, we're thinking also how do you um, reclad this? So three uh, variations on the same theme, I would say. So for the Wilder building, looking onto the Place des Festivals, we'll, we'll have a, a new screen of uh, fretted glass uh, so that we can project if, uh, because this is a a, a, ver a very animated space in, during the, even the winter. Um, uh, for the Grand Ballet Canadien on this side, it will be a combination of translucent and clear glass, uh, but also faceted, so it's all angled. And on the other side, on De Bleury Street, we added some color for the school dance and the two contemporary uh, dance company that will be housed in the, uh, the, the, the interior of the L-shaped Wilder, which is here. So jo just go rapidly, some of the intent was uh, make this building also as accessible as possible. So this is De Bleury Street, 
and uh, we'll be able to go through here and go directly to, the, to this public space towards the Place des Festivals, which goes this way. And then above, you'll have the rehearsal uh, space for the Grand Ballet Canadien. Canadien. This is a very packed building, really, a very dense building, I must say. Um, here, another section this way, the same spaces for the Grand Ballet Canadien, but here you'll have four stacked uh, rehearsal spaces, one for the Tangente, uh, one for the school dance, uh, we'll, um, and this is slightly angled. So, you, but on the outside you'll have um, not on outside of the box, but uh, inside you'll have a corridor. So you'll see the activities going on in uh, towards that uh, rehearsal studio. Um, another section here where you we managed to incorporate a roof terrace and. You'll have also offices here in the Wilder, and this part will also house the um, uh, Ministry of Culture, which will be moving into that building overlooking the Place des Festivals, which is here. Um, I was mentioning to a student uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, we have different groups of dance company, very different outlooks. So, for example, for the Grand Ballet, they didn't want any light direct light into the studio, so everything will have to be translucent light. So we are using the Solera panels, which is kind of an insulated uh, curtain wall, but uh, with uh, fretted glass also. And on the Place des Festivals, you have the faceted uh, um, elevation for the Grand Ballet Canadien. One of the, the, the challenge for these kinds of projects where you have very uh, many components is that each one wants to have to a certain extent its own identity but you're trying to make a coherent project so that's always a challenge. Uh, the new glazing for the industrial building and how it will fit within the Place des Festivals and finally uh, how we hope this uh, will develop that is uh, on the Place des Festivals, this is St. Catherine Street, Place des Festivals is here that it will take its place within the animation of the street uh, during the festivities. This should be finished uh, around 2016, so it's undergoing starting construction um, later this fall. Thank you very much. So the idea was um, to have a discussion with Marie Paul, but also taking questions from the audience. Um, so I just had a quick question regarding, um, because a lot of us are, are developing uh, a residential unit, um, so regarding uh, Lille Rosemont, yeah. um, it struck me that, that you kind of very adamantly separated your two residential volumes. So you had one volume that was strictly one kind of residential and then one volume that um, was more like a, a family residential. And yeah. I was wondering what, what was the reasoning behind kind of that movement and also how do you kind of treat the intersections between those two volumes? Well, um, the reason for the two lobbies is because um, perhaps contrary to what we would expect, the, um, the client was adamant that they could not be mixed the family with the old age people, <laughs> the seniors. Uh, I was not convinced about that, but they were adamant that they needed to have two separate entrances. but. As I said, even though I have my doubt as to the reasoning behind that, that's what allowed us to, uh, as I said, to create these two separate volumes. Because otherwise, if you have just one bank of elevators, you need to link everything. So if you look, for example, at social housing in, uh, in Europe, well, what always strikes me is that, uh, for example, for a 100-unit uh, apartment complex, they'll have like seven uh, elevators. And here in North America, it's always the minimum a number of, uh, of elevators, so we always end up with two elevators. It, 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 it drives the design afterwards because you cannot make holes into that building because you have to link every, store, uh, every story. So the fact that it was ironical that we were kind of uh, not to uh, reconcile with the idea that you could not mix the families and the uh, seniors, but at the same time that's what allowed us to develop this kind of opening in between so that this wing is just for the families and this wing is for the uh, seniors. Does that answer the question or? Yeah, okay. yeah it does, thank you. Okay. Hi, 
Hi. Um, my question is more uh, um, in terms of the city of Montreal itself. Um, I found it very interesting when you pr presented a project that was in the, plat in the plateau where the, they used the blue brick. And then you said that people responded by saying it was a bit too contemporary. Um, that just makes me wonder, do you think that the city of Montreal is very conservative in terms of its architecture? How do they respond to new and contemporary designs? I mean, Place des Arts for me is pretty much, it's very contemporary and people find mm -hmm. it very successful and it's, mm -hmm. it is very successful. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to residential areas, when we're trying to introduce new materials or new volumes or new forms, people tend to say it's too contemporary or it's yeah. too new. What do you think of? Yeah. Um, I would say that uh, the, the case of the Ben Evesque is um, uh, very uh, specific to its location and to the period it, uh, it, it occurred. I think the, the neighborhood at that point was kind of split between uh, newcomers and people living in the area. And it's also, um, it's not that difficult to, uh, to get uh, 100 people to sign a petition and haven't seen no drawings. That's what had happened, you know, no drawings being circulated. There's somebody said, I've seen or I've went to the city and this is much too modern. So, um, so basically the opposition was for, from lack of communication, basically. So I wouldn't say in general the city is conservative. No, I don't, I don't think so. Not more than, and in fact, they're more light in, in some ways. I find that... Um, now the city administratively is very fragmented. We have uh, what uh, must be like 20 arrondissements, which are neighborhoods, uh, and each has its own mayor. And so the, the, the kind of opening to, towards contemporary architecture changes a lot, however, from one neighborhood to the other. But um, no, I, I would say that, uh, and that's why I mentioned the Bailey Vibe, because it seems to me that that was kind of a turning point. You know, it's no longer as easy to just object to a project, just saying it will be too modern. There's too many examples that have been built since the last 20 years that we can always relate uh, or invoke that precedent. And this is a precedent that's often mentioned. And also, you were mentioning the, the brick, which is kind of, a, I, w I would say it's a black brick, but uh, not a blue brick, but it's a, an iron manganese brick. And uh, that's interesting also because that was the, the only, the second instance that uh, a project was using that brick in Montreal. And um, we managed to get it through because some houses around the bath, uh, the pool, had painted their brick dark gray. And we said, well, this is kind of contextual, you know, it's, uh, and, uh, and it became extraordinarily popular. It's a very nice brick. It, has, it reacts with the light magnificently. It changes when the light is on or not. And it's, it's become, you know, kind of a conspicuous now in residential project in Montreal because architects like the contrast. Uh, it there's a connotation of modernity, of contemporaneity, and it's so, so very often you'll see that brick in Montreal. And I would say that one thing that has changed a lot in the last 20 years is that in terms of housing, it has improved uh, a lot. You know, promoters now are doing uh, okay project, whereas before they were just doing like uh, copies of, uh, or very basic or unimaginative uh, design. Now I think there's a, at least there, in it, in, the answer, the construction boom, but also the buying boom, uh, boom of condos at, has proven that there was a clientele, there was a niche for that. So. Um, how early did your firm's work start to take on um, commissions for public buildings? And um, what, why did you pursue that? Yeah. I, I wouldn't know uh, the complete history of the office, and you, you have to know that uh, it's been existing since the early 50s. You know, it's a very old office that got different generation of architects. Uh, since I've been at the office, so it's more than 25 years, um, our mainstay of the work has always been public architecture. Uh, why is that? There's, I think there's two main reasons. One is that we didn't have particularly uh, business contacts. <laughs> Very often private commission comes through contact and uh, we didn't. And uh, the second thing also is, uh, it's probably more important also, is that first of all, I would venture to say there's still a larger share of the construction that's publicly initiated in Quebec than in the rest of Canada. And traditionally also this is the kind of work where you had um, a little bit more leeway in terms of design. There were usually it's, it's, it's work that you have to report to a com committee and very often 
nobody will want to say, well, I don't want this just on their own instinct, whereas they're just representatives as opposed to being the person who pays for it. So I think there's a bit of a uh, arm's length, a bit more and more respect for the uh, for the architects. So if I would say, you know, if, if I look around and I, I look at the 20 very good uh, or good architectural firms in Quebec, um, I would say they mostly work into public, uh, doing public commissions. I don't know if what, what you would agree, Marie-Paul, but uh, it's, that's, that's the way I perceive it. And so if you wanted to, um, to tackle architecture at a slightly higher level than just the basics, that's basically what you had to do. The downside is that very often the budget are not very good. So I think that's one reason also perhaps we've come to do uh, much more straightforward projects, less, less detail oriented, for example, than the McCord was, for example, because very often when you have to choose, well, it's a big idea that gets built and not the finicky details or the nice details that you would love to do but just don't have the money for it to do. <laughs> Answer the question of, uh, hmm. our, uh, I guess there's a tradition of competitions in Quebec. There's mm -hmm. definitely not just a, a tradition of competitions, there's a tradition of a kind of public uh, interest and advocacy for competitions. Mm -hmm. There's coverage of the results of the competitions. There's people paying attention to who is building this public building and evaluating it, talking about it afterwards. So I think all those uh, foci, you could say, uh, lead, lead, lead to a, a more maybe lively uh, discourse around public buildings. And, and there's also that kind of positive effect of many of the architects being partly involved in teaching and private mm. practice and that was kind of the question that I wanted to ask you to talk for talk about for a little bit because you've had some involvement with the University of Montreal for the last 10 years and you started out mm. recognizing that and maybe the way that your office integrates mm. practice and teaching. Yeah, um, as I said I never taught uh, while I was uh, studying that I would eventually teach. Um, it, I came to teaching because somebody asked me and after the first few tries, I guess they, they, they thought that I was not so bad and they kept me. Um, the, I always, when I start talking about it, I always say, however, the, the primary emphasis is on the practice, however, so I will teach fairly regularly, but it has to, I have to juggle that with the, um, the, the professional side also. Uh, I find that what it brings to the practice is uh, very often people will say, oh, they think uh, you have the first shot at the best students and they think that's the main reason you do it. Very, I've, I, for the longest time, we, we didn't hire uh, former t uh, students of mine and just uh, three years ago, we hired two students and they were in fact involved in the exhibition that's uh, on display now, and, uh, but it was the first time that we, we did that and it was fantastic with a very, very good uh, help at the exhibition. Um, so what it, what it brings, however, is that uh, it forces you also to um, confront your ideas with uh, younger people. Uh, it also brings you out of the office and meet colleagues. Strangely enough, uh, very often you're, when you're working in an office, you're working always with the same people. And there, uh, at the university, since there's a fair amount of practitioners also, but also permanent teachers, you, it, it's, it's, a, it's a collegial atmosphere that I very much like. Um, the other side also is that we tackle at the university um, the level I'm teaching first year some, uh, masters and uh, with Irena Latec we concentrate on building of um, uh, at, at the urban scale um, perhaps a bit uh, bigger even than the, the, the project I reviewed uh, this afternoon with some of your colleagues and uh, this this is a line of projects that very seldom do you get uh, commissioned for. So it's a way also of uh, developing your uh, a, a new knowledge with the students, tackling bigger issues than that, that you don't necessarily have uh, the opportunity to, to do in the practice. Uh, sometimes I'll just show you one, one slide. Um, 
uh, it doesn't hap happen very often, but it happens that this year we worked on a site that's, uh, as, a, as a studio, we worked on a site that's uh, next to the one that I just showed you on uh, Rosemont. Okay, so this, uh, this is the site for the Rosemont a project that I showed you, and this is one student proposal. And for the, um, for the last semester, we worked on this site here. So, and you have the example of two projects. This is the big industrial project I, I, show, I showed you that's been transformed by these students into condos. Uh, this also was housing further along the viaduct. So that was one of the more uh, concrete application, you know, where you could test ideas also with students that would probably would inform quite rapidly your own practice. So that's another dimension that we get out of uh, schooling. Yeah. Thanks very much, Frederick, and I hope everyone has a chance to visit the exhibition. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.